Oh, your camera's not on. Holy oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. <laughs> you forgot all about that. Okay, you're live. Okay. Good morning and welcome to the second day of the Scholar Strike Canada teachings. I'm Beverly Bain. I'm Kristen Boss. Good morning. I'd like to welcome our ASL interpreters, uh, Gregorio Nieto and Selena Flowers, and Denise Agard, our closed captioner, and they will be uh, working um, with our teachings today. Um, I'll begin now with the land acknowledgement. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are broadcasting the teachings for Scholar Strike from Toronto, Takaronto, the sacred land on which we live, work, and organize. For over 15,000 years, this land has been home to Indigenous peoples who have lived and continue to live in relation with the land in ways that have been proven to be ecologically sustainable, anti-capitalist, and vital to our shared future. We must honor our relations. This land is the territory of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. Toronto is the home to one of the largest and most diverse Indigenous communities in what is currently called Canada. The very inception of Canada has been marked by the violent dispossession of Indigenous peoples and the brutal enslavement of African peoples. This place that is Canada is shaped and sustained by the ever-present settler colonial and colonial racist, Islamophobic, violence that criminalizes and murder Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous, Black, and racialized peoples. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the ongoing struggle for Indigenous sovereignty that continues in this country. Land protectors continue to be targeted and arrested on their own territories, such as Anishina, Anishinaabe Kwe Vanessa Gray, who was targeted at her home by Toronto Police Services and Canadian Pacific Police Services, a private railroad police force in connection to a solidarity action for Wet'suwet'en in December of 2021. This is part of a larger pattern of colonial violence in which the Canadian state collaborates with corporations to criminalize Indigenous land defenders while continuing to dispossess Indigenous peoples of their land. Colonization is first and foremost about land, the control of it and the erasure of indigenous peoples from their land. As scholars, artists, activists, students and others gathered here together, it is our obligation to be in relations with indigenous peoples, the land and with each other. Thank you much, Bev. Um, I would like to also, again, remind you and invite you, those who are able, to come out and join us as we gather tomorrow, Wednesday, March 23rd, at 12 p.m. at the intersection of Young Street and Gould Street at X University in the spot where the statue of residential school architect Egerton Ryerson fell last summer to reclaim and mark spaces of refusal, resistance, and resurgence against ongoing settler colonialism, anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism, and police violence. As we gather to remember our shared histories of protest and maintain a practice of being in public in space without fear and raising our voices. Our guided march will tour historic and ongoing sites of resistance in downtown Toronto. You can expect to hear from speakers across our shared struggle, including No Pride in Policing Coalition, who will speak to the history of the Black Action Defense Committee uh, following the protests um, of the 1992 police killing of Raymond Lawrence, as well as the bathhouse raids in 1981. You will hear from Elda Elder Wanda Whitebird of No More Silence, who will speak to our right to remember and organize on behalf of our missing and murdered Indigenous relations and relatives. And you will also hear from speakers from the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project, the former Parkdale Encampment Support Network, folks speaking to No Cops on Campus, as well as the Palestinian exception on our campuses and more. We will end with incredible Indigenous art and a feast of corn soup. And while um, I can't guarantee 
the most beautiful weather tomorrow, I can tell you to please bring an umbrella just in case. And I can promise many incredible histories and stories and of course, warm soup at the end. We are really excited to bring you out for this. We've been making banners all week um, and it's gonna be a really beautiful gathering. We have a full day of programming for you today. Please check out our website. We've got teach-ins on harm reduction organizing and abolition politics, the Black feminist struggle and transnational politics of abolition, the backlash to police funding and abolition. We've got a great teach-in on no walls, no cages, and no borders, uh, as well as a, another incredible poetry reading by Erica Violet Lee. So we hope you check out our website and learn lots with us today. Miigwech. Thank you. So you'll just let us know when it's uh, gone yeah. live and we're ready to start. Yeah, sorry, just give me a second. Oh yeah, no, take your time. Okay, you're live. Okay, great. Um, very excited to be here today for our session at the Scholars Strike on Policing the Pandemic. Um, thank you to Dr. Beverly Bain and everyone else who's been organizing powerfully beyond, behind the scholar strike. Um, our session today uh, focuses on the expansion and intens intensification of police powers in the pandemic. Using a broad notion of policing, the panel covers police racism in enforcing public health measures, police violence using unhoused peoples in encampments, indigenous people and black and racialized community like Jane and Finch, policing extended through social work and academic institutions, and how data collection and technology is used against people in the pandemic. Um, first off, I also wanna really thank the closed captioners and the ASL team, um, and we'll say thank you afterwards, but thank you for their dedicated work to do this. I'm really excited today for our speakers. We're gonna start off by having um, Sam Tickel of X University, then we're, we'll hear from um, Adil Abdul um, Hai from X University, excuse me, um, and Lana James from the University of Toronto. Brianna Olson could not be with, with us today from Toronto, in, 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 in Toronto Indigenous Harm Reduction Network, um, and we send her lots of love. For, um, and, um, but unfortunately, she's not able to be here today. Um, my name is Alexander McClelland, and I was invited to join today as a moderator because of my work at the intersections of life, law, and disease, where as an AIDS activist and as someone living with HIV and a critical criminologist now at Carleton University at the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice, in the first phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, I founded a counter mapping and data activist project called the Policing the Pandemic Mapping Project. And that project examined the ways that police were placed as central actors in terms of responding to collective health issues um, and to put into question and scrutinize this. Um, I also helped organize some community-based responses to address the harms of policing a pandemic, specifically uh, helping organize to or in response to when the Ontario government created a legal data portal to share all COVID positive data of people who tested COVID positive with police uh, in the first waves of the pandemic, which was an unprecedented privacy violation, unseen like anything in other jurisdictions in the world, except for a few. Um, we also, uh, uh, we also collectively did work thinking through the coercive aspects of public health as being needed to be connected to abolition and defund police discussions. Before COVID, my main work was on the issue of HIV criminalization um, and uh, where I, I documented the lived experiences of people who have been criminalized across Canada and have examined the ways in which the police and public health often work in concert to support and reinforce criminalization um, using a logic of carceral public health. And for those of, who are, of you who are unaware, in this settler colony called Canada, we, still, um, we are still recognized internationally with the heinous distinction of having one of the highest 
rates of HIV-related criminalization in the world. Since 1989, over 204 people have faced criminal charges. This manifests along long-standing lines of inequity um, HIV criminalization, thanks to the research of e Dr. Eli Manning and Colin Hastings, among others, we know that this is a highly racialized phenomenon and a, and a highly gendered phenomenon um, with Black men and Indigenous women highly overrepresented in this case, these cases. And we have similar, similar um, patterns of inequity and enforcement happening in the context of COVID-19. Um, in relation to COVID-19, a reliance on public health in concert with police enforcement response says to health issues has been deeply, uh, has deeply cemented the role of police, um, where police have been position, positioned as central actors in responding to health, co collective health issues. Um, and while my project, the Policing the Pandemic Project, had to give up um, collecting data on the enforcement of COVID because there was so much of it we couldn't keep up. Uh, a recent report coming out of the University of Sherbrooke from Dr. Veronique Fortin and her colleagues outlined that in one year, more than 46,000 tickets were issued across Quebec for alleged violations against public health laws. And so for our session, kind of considering all of these issues, I have uh, four main questions that I'm gonna pose to our presenters today that they can use as a, a potentially generative uh, piece for moving the conversation forward. And the first one are, what paths of resistance to countering pandemic policing can we bolster and strengthen? Um, what roles could counter surveillance or and or sue surveillance play as a tactic for communities to, to begin chipping away at the deeply entrenched pandemic policing architecture that has emerged. And pandemic policing has seen a widespread weaponization of, of data to aid in, in further marginalizing and oppressing communities. How are communities working to take ownership of their own data in new ways in this context? And finally, the last question, um, the longest one, um, uh, with the police being positioned as central actors in responses to public health during um, the pandemic, during this specific pandemic and others, um, we see that the institution of police and public health are deeply intertwined and not distinct from one another. What are the consequences of this intertwining of police and public health when we talk about abolition and defund movements? And so, each presenter will have 15 minutes to talk about these questions and more and all of their amazing work. Really excited to hear all of this. Um, I'll first start with introducing um, Sam, um, Sam Tickle's research um, and scholarly work uh, spans across the areas of Black, uh, Black and diaspora studies, urban studies and, and the sociology of education. His work focuses on the analysis of diverse experiences, trajectories, and expressions of Blackness grounded in particular histories of racialization, colonization, community formations, and resistance. His forthcoming book, Black Grammars on Difference and Belonging, examines the experiences and perspectives related to Blackness and Black identification of East African Black diasporas uh, across the UK, Canada, and the US. More broadly, Sam is interested in questions of Black solidarity, Black cultural production, and his expressions across the diaspora. I'll hand it over to you, Sam. Really excited to have you here. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Alex. And, and thank you to Scholar Strike Canada for convening us, I think. In a, in a very important moment as the, the political ground beneath us uh, shifts uh, in, this, in this country. So really, really honored to, to be here and to share uh, some, of, some, of, some of the work that we get to do um, regarding this issue. So um, the, the, this, I'll, I'll provide just kind of like a brief comments uh, and you know, a perspective of the intensification of policing in a community like Jaina Finch that really, I think in my just brief opening and, and definitely interested in, the, in an in interactive conversation, I wanted to provide some historical context um, around policing and, and, and Jane and Finch that exceeds, I think, the pandem pandemic, exceeds uh, recent, you know, even, even the most recent abolitionist demands for defunding and abolishing the police, uh, which remain timely and necessary, even if our, you know, municipal and political uh, politicians, sorry, especially those that tell us they are, they are our allies and com comrades have moved on, uh, we have not. Uh, we, we can't afford to have moved on from imagining this kind of or reckoning with abolitionist uh, futures. 
Um, so what much of what I'll say comes from having the honor of working and building with a diverse set of community organizers, community builders, community workers, uh, from a range of ages, class and racial backgrounds from all over the world. We convene in Jane Fincher from there. We imagine different worlds, different ways of organizing life. And then as best we can, we build toward it. Um, from you know, Jane Finch Action Against Poverty, uh, aunties to comrades to the SBL youth uh, who constantly keep us, keep us uh, relevant, fresh, and telling us what's most pressing. These reflections, while they're my own, in some sense, they're always collectives. Uh, though I, I'll own all errors and critiques, they, they rest with me. Um, some, some of what I'll share today, readers can find in, in a couple of essays. Uh, I have an essay in uh, Life at the Intersection, Community Class and Schooling, a uh, book by Carl James. Uh, and recently, Wanda McNevin, a social historian from the community, has produced The People's History of Jaina Finch. Its title is By Us, For Us, Activism in Jaina Finch, a Working Class Community. Um, I have a chapter in there uh, that's titled How Anti-Black Racism Underdeveloped Jane Finch, and it appears as the last in that volume. And I want to begin there with historical context for a few reasons to demonstrate this kind of long history of police surveillance in a community like Jane Finch, not as particular or special, but precisely the opposite, to demonstrate how front and center police presence is, how deeply entrenched policing and surveillance is to everyday life for people who live in Jane Finch and communities like them. For those maybe outside of the context of Toronto, Jane Finch is a complex community made up of diverse neighborhoods and peoples that have always faced stigma, structural neglect, continued and sustained disinvestment from all levels of government, which itself intensified throughout the pandemic. Uh, if we remember, we, uh, knew, we know where to go where we wanted to find the long, long, long lines um, for testing or the long, long, long lines um, for, for vaccine, uh, to procure vaccines those long lines were in communities like Chain of Finch and those on the outskirts of the city. From a city and provincial planning perspective, I assert that anti-Black racism has always been the organizing principle of, of Jane of Finch, despite the appearance of what you might, we might call development or revitalization. We, we, we see now, uh, those of us who, who live and work there would call gentrification, historical and contemporaneous anti-Black racism is the constant and the anger that constitutes how Jane of Finch has been governed. The core reason why it's been neglected and despite current appearances, why it has ultimately been underdeveloped. For all intents and purposes, Jane of Finch is known for many things, but most of all is known as a Black city space. And so it's policed like that. While conversations on police have reached a feverish pitch of late, both not only the kind of budgetary resources we, we, uh, we or our cities continually uh, devote to policing, but also the philosophy of policing, right? So it's, it's important for us to remember that in communities like Jane and Finch, these conversations are not budgetary conversations. They're at the core uh, co conversations about how we might want to live um, social life, right? So that is the level at which these conversations take place. Um, while conversations, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I want to lay some of that history out in this short presentation. Uh, so first, let me turn our attention to Home Feeling, uh, Struggle for a Community, a 1983 documentary film by Jennifer Hodge and Roger McTair. Coming in at just under 58 minutes and released uh, in, in 83, the documentary remains endlessly relevant. It's a timeless piece of social history. And on each viewing surprises even me in the intimate moments residents shared with Hodge and McTair about the, dif uh, about the difficulties of everyday life uh, for black working class uh, and poor people, but also the ways they captured uh, how police operate in black communities, not as a service, but as a constant force. And you know, at that time, the police, uh, Toronto police were called a force. And, and, and for me, that is something I continue to call them. They are not a service uh, for, for black people. I wanted to play a short clip to show the uh, relevance of this documentary. I'm going to try and share my screen and have us watch one minute. Um, it is, oh, I don't think I can share the screen. Um, perhaps I can get permission, but if not, it's okay. I can give the um, the minutes. Um, at 28 minutes, uh, 28 minutes, 10 seconds, for about a minute, we follow what is uh, a black a black police officer um, you know, conducting his daily du duties. So let's watch that one minute now. I really, you know, took the teaching part of this seriously. <laughs> Certain cultures, it's not uncommon for them to congregate in an area and uh, sort of hash it out and just have a good time and socialize. Okay. Now, the problem we have with that in particular is that it's not that we at the police are against them congregating. 
by no means are we against that. What we are against is the problems that derive from that. The um, they tend to carry on some of the activities which are much common in their community, like uh, drinking, alcohol, and uh, sort of like developing a party atmosphere where they're um, having a party right on the street. What's your name? Yeah. Arnold. Arnold, you got any identification on it? Yeah. Oh, Hey, your tapes are yeah. What's on them? Music. Oh. You record those yourself? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where are you born? Yeah. In Jamaica. What's your address? In 106. In a house or house? What's your friend's name that you were visiting? Um, Junior. Junior what? Of course. Junior what? What do they call him? Uh, June, that's June. I don't know it's June. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for indulging me in that. So as you can see, of course, I mean, at the heart of that clip or what, what, is, what is shown to us, and I think the uh, unending relevance, is that simply Black sociality, Black congregation in of itself is a problem. Yeah? Uh, this is the core problem or core function of policing. It has always been to police this kind of communion. Uh, specifically black communion right so the partying the having fun the drinking uh, it's an incredible documentary um next i want to um share a short clip uh from the real toronto dvd which began which first began to circulate in 2005 um that showed us a glimpse of black youth living in communities across toronto um in that it's 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 been i guess in most readings a really misunderstood and misread piece of important i think black toronto historical document Black youth told us um, about the kind of the kind of policing uh, they experienced. So this is 2005. Let me show this very short clip about the kind of policing and surveillance that they experienced. Okay. You know, coming up around here was messed up, and cops is on you. By the time. Let me tell you, let me tell you how it works. By the time you even reach of age, like 12, 13, cops is trying to put record. Cops is trying to put a record on you. They're trying to put the record on you so they could identify you. They want 20 masks down there where they know every man there. They don't know somebody there, it's a problem. You know, they want to come probably shake and shake someone down for some IV or something. You know, they got an asshole book they ride around with. It's called the asshole book. You know, they just flip through pages. Like everyone's face is in there, you know, they identify you from that. Okay, thank you so much. So from 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 uh, home feeling uh, to the asshole uh, book in real Toronto, uh, and then to the to the to the kind of database we you know Desmond Cole has has drawn our attention to um, has been has been important in his book, The Skin We're In: uh, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. Desmond Cole details a community youth program called Cops and K Kids. And, and Gerald in, in, in that text tells Cole how the police quote started asking every individual, what's your name, where are you from? Gerald remembers that sometimes there'd be a lineup of boys waiting to leave the center, but who were not allowed to leave unless they first identified themselves to police. What the police would say is, we know that you're from a certain neighborhood. And as a result, if you don't forfeit your first and last name, you can't leave from here. So they tried to put people in the box. And some of those were there, some of those people were there for the first time. They had no clue what the police were talking about. And, and, and this, I think, um, tells us at least that the mistrust and resistance that Black communities, Indigenous folks, and racialized people have always uh, experienced with uh, police is rational. Uh, it's generational, um, and this 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 tell this takes us, I think, to to right before the pandemic, where um, police, the Toronto Police Force, had installed CCTV cameras across Black and racialized communities across the city across the city. 
And the objectives they told us were to deter crime, increase public safety, use camera footage as an aid to identify suspects involved in unlawful activities and use camera footage as evidence in court. And at the core of that, that policy or that initiative was this idea that we should trust police, right? That we should be, um, that, that we should have a, a kind of a social contract with policing. There is no historical context for that, for that, for that demand or for that request. Um, and as that's noticed circulated among network of community organizations, residents and grassroots groups across the city, um, many, many, many of us, you know, had, had organized meetings. We talked about how we might identify some of this process and, and how, to, how to kind of intervene in that, in that, in that, in, in that another layer of surveillance, right? Not to mention an increase again in the budget. And that was at the same time, and this is also all pre-pandemic, just for our historical context, that we had learned of the, the Clearview AI scandal. Which, which was uh, Toronto Police's secretive use of controversial and unethical facial recognition software. Um, again, yet another reason that we should understand that Toronto Police Force cannot or should not be trusted. And you know, it, ca it casts much doubt on the utility of this body to uh, the Toronto Police Services uh, you know, oversight body to, to provide substantive oversight. And at the time, Chief Mark Saunders, uh, you know, the black police <laughs> chief, uh, it was stated on the record that he did, he wasn't even aware of the use of Clearview AI tech among his officers. So, so I think it, the firm belief of many of you know the folks that have spoken on 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 this on the, at this conference um, that this initiative of policing of increased policing, which intensified during the pandemic, because as we know, um, Toronto Police installed a whole other set of CCTV cameras across downtown uh, Toronto ahead of the ahead of. Uh, you know, the, the trucker convoy um, entering our city. So this, of course, will result in more racist policing, more racial profiling, increased harassment of Black and racialized uh, residents across the city. Um, and, and I think that the, the history that were, is important for us to kind of en enumerate here has been identified by so many more bodies, uh, Toronto Star, Ontario Human Rights Commission, CAP report, um, that tells us about this kind of long history of surveillance. Um, and I think just to kind of end, I wanted to think about the continued kind of, uh, and, I, and I'll stop here, I have more, but we can, we can go through the discussion. At the, at the, how policing intensified during the, during the onset of the pandemic, which was also to the most chaotic moment, um, the really kind of like saturated point of the pa uh, pandemic, uh, we, we have a, a kind of collective body that meets called the Jane and Finch Education Action Group. It brings together public and Catholic school administrators, trustees. We've had, you know, the Catholic and Toronto directors of education come in. And we've been having these kind of bi-weekly conversations to talk about, you know, pre-pandemic and during the pandemic to discuss community-based strategies for, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, bringing resources, improving education, thinking about how, how our kids experience schooling. At the onset of the pandemic, when we all moved you know, all, all act uh, factors of social life and work to the virtual, we learned that school boards were doing wellness checks with families, checking in to see if students and their families were connected, whether they, you know, needed to get online, whether they needed any devices. This, of course, was not, you know, something that the school board had had front, had school boards had front in mind. So, you know, community organizations uh, like SBL, where I work, or other ones, stepped in to kind of, you know, um, steady, steady the waters. It was a moment of, to be clear, high chaos. So through the Jane and Finch Education Action Group meetings, we learned that you know, you know, families uh, that school boards were calling families and and uh, you know students checking in to 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 make sure that they were all kind of online and in schooling. And for those that they weren't able to reach, they were doing wellness checks. The school boards and the administrators were calling police to do the wellness checks. Now. Uh, that is actually kind of mind boggling because you know we're in this moment of deeply questioning policing, but even in this moment of chaos, we turn or our you know, school administrators turn to policing to provide wellness checks. But they, they were asking um, the police you know, at, in, that, in our community 31 division to not send uniformed and armed police officers to people's homes. I mean, to say the least, we were you know, aghast, shocked by such you know, an ad hoc practice being instituted even in the midst of the chaotic time that was the early onset of the pandemic. But is this not what policing does? It warps logic. It tells us, despite all that we know, that sending police to mostly Black students' families' homes is in their best interest. It's in, in the interest of their safety. It's in the interest of their wellness. As we've learned again most recently, 
Nobody tells the police what to do. Our mayor, our you know, premier, sitting mayor and sitting premier constantly uh, remind us that they do not direct the police. So when administrators, teachers, principals, social care service agencies have to turn to police to do these wellness checks, they go as they know how, in uniform, in, in uh, fully armed. And notwithstanding what the Ontario Human Rights Commission tells, report tells us that Black people in mental health distress and their interactions with police are 20 times more likely to die. This is what the school boards were doing when they instituted this de facto policy for our own safety. And that's a dearth of imagination, right? This is what happens when cities devote grotesque amounts of city resources to police. They become the de facto answer to everything. That de and this is another warped logic that detasking the police still means that they can demand more and more resources. It doesn't operate like that for any other city service. I know that in my job, if I am detasked or I do less, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't get, I don't get paid the same amount. So that detasking line, the sly and cynical diversion from the core demanding that defunding and abolition, abolition holds, is the kind of bob and weave we expect from Toronto's political class. It's also one that our universities have have taken on, right? This idea that they're going to detask campus security or campus police. Um, that, that, that line and that kind of short and a rich history I've detailed here always brings me back to the core function of policing in this city, in this province, this country, and this world is to police our movements, to police Black racialized and people of color's ability to move freely in whatever cities we find ourselves. And I, and you know, from the vantage point of Jana Finch and the kind of history I've laid out here, we have to ask as it relates to police and their tasks, what would they do if they couldn't police poor people? And, I, and I'll stop there. Thank you so, so much for the time. Thank you, Sam, for your excellent work. So great to learn about all the work you're doing in Jane and Finch. Um, I'm going to hand it up over now to uh, Dr. Adil uh, Abdullahi, uh, uh, who is an assistant professor uh, at the School of Disability Studies, cross appointed to the School of uh, Social Work and advisor to the Dean on Anti-Black Racism. Um, at the Faculty of Community and Social Services at X University. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Abdullah Dahi is a critical Black interdisciplinary scho scholar, researcher, policy analyst, grassroots organizer, and experienced practitioner across healthcare, institutional policy, and social service settings. She is the author of uh, Black Women Under the State Surveillance, Poverty and Violence of Social Assistance, which is an excellent book. Uh, I encourage you all to get, along with a few other books. Um, and really excited to have you here. Looking forward to the words you have to share with us today. Thank you so much, Alex. And thanks, Sam, uh, for that really comprehensive um, and fulsome discussion. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is just provide some reflections on um, the questions that, that were posed for this panel, particularly from my vantage point um, in thinking about disability as well as um, madness, policing, policy, so forth. So uh, one of the key questions that was asked on this panel were, uh, was what, what are some of the pathways uh, to counter, uh, to encourage resistance, particularly during the pandemic? And I think one of the things that's really crucial for me is to really look at um, communities who have been consistently marginalized and left on, uh, left outside and pushed outside of, um, you know, health and state systems more generally. And for that, obviously, for me, I look to uh, people and communities that are disabled, mad, crip, um, queer, Black, Indigenous, so forth. Because um, I think for, for many folks, uh, what, what happened is uh, during the pandemic, we were asked to stop. We were asked to think about how we're living in this world. We're asked to um, maybe have reduced access to particular kinds of supports and resources. And for many communities, while the pandemic certainly, um, and without a doubt, has made particular kinds of things um, harder for all of us, there are many of us who have been living with and through these kinds of um, isolations, uh, these kinds of exclusions and uh, captivities in, in many ways. Um, so I also draw us and turn our attention to those who have been uh, in, incarcerated, um, those who are in prisons, who have been um, really managing and fighting back and dealing with uh, 
all of the lockdowns, uh, like what I, I guess we're in our fifth wave now, uh, really thinking about what the impact of that is um, as well in congregate settings, not, not just in prison settings, but certainly um, a population that's that, that I'm quite close to and thinking about how that has impacted and how they've managed to really galvanize and report back, um, keep each other well and, and maintain each other. Um, and again, I point us to, of course, across all of these junctures are working class people um, and working class people who we saw um, on, on the front lines during the pandemic of which are, um, you know, government, government certainly left, left behind. Um, we saw uh, people, you know, essential workers that were mainly racialized people. We saw the struggles of those who have, um, are and continue to be working uh, in, as migrant workers. Uh, so forth. So those would be some of the first places I think that it's important for us to turn our attention to because those are the sites I believe that we can truly garner some um, some some knowledge and, and really meaningful ways about um, how we intervene in, in these times. I think um, as Sam pointed out really well, which I think you know is is really crucial is not just necessarily the ways that we're further deploying police. Um, but also to really think about the expansive nature of policing. So the expansive nature of policing, just simply to use the example that Sam provided, um, which is, you know, this idea that we're going to conduct wellness checks, right? So while we're thinking again, you know, well, police shouldn't be showing up in their uniforms, police shouldn't be showing up in their weapons. Firstly, police shouldn't be showing up for wellness checks at all. Um, and that's because we've seen in the data, as it's reflected, that police are not able to, quote, de-escalate. Police are not able to resolve um, issues really easily. But what we're seeing now is then we involve the school system. We involve, you know, the classroom teacher. We involve the social worker. We involve the, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the educational assistant and so forth. So while I think often we place our um, our eye at the thing that's closest to us, closest to us, which is those who are in uniform, um, I think one we really have to be mindful of what we think the uniform means, um, but also then what happens when we say or or encourage for for folks to not have a uniform on. And to that, I really think about um, as well the interventions that are happening, for example, around suggestions of increased access to mental health services, particularly, for example, for Black folks. We see that there's been, um, my colleagues and I uh, recently have, um, my colleagues and I, sorry, uh, Anne Riquetto um, and Maddie uh, DeWells have written a, a short piece in the uh, Healthy Debate that's looking at how we use apps and the increased use of apps, uh, particularly as it relates to responding to mental health. So, you know, again, I think about um, how, why it is that, you know, the, the most created apps during the time of COVID has been mental health apps at about 36,000 new mental health apps being created in North America. So when we think about um, who we're going to to generate data and information and how we're collecting that information, who has access to that information, you know, and system interconnections, which hopefully we can talk about a little bit later, um, two key areas and two key populations that these uh, data collections or mental health apps are being used with our university students. Um, a big, big place where these they're they're trying out these uh, research studies data with students by encouraging them to use these apps in order to track their own mental health, and also with students who are um, in K to twelve. And so, you know, again, I point us to thinking about when we're tracking and wanting to garner data. It's interesting that we're going to particular kinds of populations. Um, and again, just to connect that back with sort of some of the government's directions, you know, in Trudeau's uh, liberal platform, one of his major uh, directions was investing in um, the Canada mental health transfer, of which the targeted population was racialized people, right? And then we go specifically into uh, Black people. So then what does it mean then when we're, when the government uh, and, and the Liberal government, an entire platform is saying, well, we're putting all this money into mental health, we're putting it into apps, um, while simultaneously seeing that uh, there has been no less deaths in uh, fatal shootings with police. There's been, um, you know, no no real kind of a meaningful intervention. So, you know, when we talk about rationality and irrationality, we have to look at both of these issues alongside each other. It's a maddening kind of a response. 
um, and you know to to really have to have to think about that and to think about on the one hand we are the government is saying that they're providing all this money but the money that they're providing in many ways communities are also not um, not seeing and interacting uh, with some of those funds or sorry getting access to some of those funds um, and I think again uh, really thinking about just coming back to this idea of public health and policing and so forth um, I also think again just like I said really stepping back from this idea and thinking about all of the interactions that people had during the pandemic, uh, racialized people and you know, indigenous people around just being policed regardless. So how the pandemic served as an invitation uh, to further descend on uh, you know, black people, racialized people, working class people, and to really think about what are some of the deep impacts uh, of, of that. Um, and I think maybe I'll just end with the pieces about you know, what, trusting, and we can talk about this later, trusting data. Yes, um, Sam is correct regarding uh, looking at how the uh, Toronto Police Service was using Clearview AI data, um, and not just the Toronto Police Service, but using it and to go search uh, other people's COVID status outside of the outside of their own jurisdiction, right? So again, we see this, this is not the first time that uh, police have used things such as Clearview AI, AI. We see what's happened with the now defunct COVID database. We also see that there's still an increase in apps and app technology um, that is being used and connected with surveillance tools and technologies. And so it's really, really important that we turn our attention to um, really not making a, a link between sort of access to healthcare and, and um, providing our information. And lastly, really thinking about how we, how we can end up criminalizing folks, particularly folks that are using drugs, particularly, again, um, individuals that are unhoused, because we have to ask, how are these system platforms interconnected? Uh, what is the impact of that? Um, and so that's sort of some of the things I'm, I'm thinking alongside. Um, you know, the 92% of privacy breaches that, you know, folks have reported um, thus far during COVID. So I'll leave it there for now, and hopefully we can continue to talk a bit more about um, some of these interconnections. Thank you so much for that, Adil. Um, and so now I'm going to hand it over, and then we'll all kind of get together and discuss more. But I'm going to hand it over to Lana James, who I'm really grateful could join us today. Uh, James's research illuminates how technology can um, undermine or bolster human rights in the context of clinical care, a rehabilitation science, and public health. Her interdisciplinary and applied research is designed to critically appraise current applications of technology while developing and implementing interventions that seed new future, new ethical futures. To accomplish this, Lana brings together academic and community scholars across disciplines and sector, sectors to work at the intersections of medical uh, medicine, clinical care, public health data, AI, law, and race and ethnicity among among uh, across multiple axes, um, including uh, such as like gender, uh, class, able-bodiedness. As a result of her groundbreaking work, she is the inaugural AI Medicine and Data Justice Postdoctoral Fellow at Queen's University. Congratulations on that position, and really looking forward to your words today, Lana. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Um, I am going to try to not take too long because I really do want to get into the discussion and dialogue amongst each other. Um, but what I am going to highlight are some of the things that I've already been talked about and also some of the contributions that I think I can make to the conversation. I'm going to take us back in time a little bit, and I think that's been important for each of us to do. Um, when uh, Sam opened and talked about what happened in uh, Jane and Finch, and Idil talked about the relationships between um, mental health, apps, technology, and the inappropriate and often illegal use of, of data and data linkages, uh, part of what this brings us to is the capability, the, the ability to actually do that computationally. And so the computational aspect is one I'm going to highlight. And the reason I'm highlighting the computational aspect is because in that movie clip that you were so, that wisdom of that showing that clip, Sam, was excellent, is that they talked about the book that they went around with, the police went around with, and that that book was used to identify. I want to make a relationship between the two things, the book that was used 
at that point in time. The book that was used and continues to be used in all apartheid states, and the book has now become a computer. So I'd like to make a connection between the book that was talked about that then became carding, um, but all of it ties back to a system that is primarily about separation and management of populations. And so what we're seeing actually is just the reinvestment in apartheid technologies, technologies that have not gone anywhere, um, technologies of apartheid that Canada has never divested from. And I think it's important to understand that we've never had a break from the apartheid state of Canada. And so I would like to remind people that um, whether you're talking about the 18s, the 19s, like 1920s, 1930s, 1960s, um, Black people who have lived in Canada since before it became Canada can tell you, and the historical record can show you, that we have had an apartheid state in which Black people are only permitted to move in certain areas, and when they move outside of those areas, they are heavily policed and, quote, beaten back into their place. And it's understood that when you're outside of your area, you have the right to be pushed back. But there is no area for Black people for which they are allowed, quote, to be, despite our supposed constitutional rights. And we know that because even when we are in, quote, the areas where we've been pushed back into because of the lack of affordable housing or the suppressed wages, noting that in Canada, Black people with similar levels of education are paid as 20% less. And so these things have a direct impact. And so the apartheid state is simply, um, if you will, increasing its computational power. I'd like to remind people that when IBM um, got its computational power, it used that to assist not only in the Holocaust in accelerating, refining, and improving it. Um, and not only did, the, did IBM do this, um, the name of the head of IBM was Watson. His name was actually Watson. And the computer, the quantum computer that has come to life in IBM is also called Watson. And I want to make a connection between the book that was in the movie that was based on paper, then became the computer that's in the police car where, as Alex talked about and our other uh, presenters talked about, COVID status data, health data, was illegally pulled into is the same system of apartheid that existed both in South Africa and other settler jurisdictions. And so the, there's a long history, an unbroken history of the apartheid state combining and linking data that violates international conventions of privacy and human rights and violates the laws of any democratic society. And that has been and continues to be one of the issues that Black people in particular and other people who are monitored for population control struggle with. And so I'd like to make a connection between medicine, the actual practice of going into a clinician, seeing your physician, your nurse practitioner, or whomever, and that illegal migration, intentional migration of data into police databases. Many people are familiar that when they go in to see their physician, your physician's fingers are often on the keyboards now. And that system is referred to as an electronic medical record. Your electronic medical record is a record of your experiences with clinicians. Your electronic health record, note the difference between an M and an H, the electronic health record is a more dynamic version of that. So it includes all of the records outside of your own principal record with that particular clinician. So that means if you've gone to a hospital for x-rays, or MRIs or external consults, that's held in your electronic record. So the EMR is your individual record and your EHR is your shared record. So what we do know about the data that was put into police cars is we know that it contained your status if you had tested positive. What we also know from the CCLA, which is the Civil Liberties Association, who filed um, the uh, inquiry and who did the depositions and who collected the data about how many inquiries were made. The inquiries that were made were most in Northern Ontario and were in the range of 10,000 and above, meaning that there would be no mathematical way in the terms of health to justify the number of inquiries given the population and the rates of COVID. So let me say that another way. This means that police officers were sitting around in their cruisers and at their desks, 
simply checking on whomever they wanted to, to be like, oh, I wonder if X has COVID. I wonder if Y has COVID. And it's very clear from that information that that had nothing to do with policing. And so when we think about an apartheid state, what we know about an apartheid state is that is the way police functions. They are now part of every aspect of your life. They do not have any of the restrictions that they should in a democratic society, and they're used to control. The other thing I wanted to flag, and I'll just keep an eye out in the chat for my timing, is we, in terms of we meaning Ready for Black Lives, which is the work that I do with my colleague, uh, C.N. Wilson, and Ready for Black Lives stands for Research, Evaluation, Data, Ethics, and that's for Black populations in Canada. And that includes a protocol that we've been working on for the last, um, couple of years with the communities across the country, coast to coast to coast, specifically for Black people to protect us from not only mis and misuse and abuse in research in the traditional sense, meaning the kind that we're used to seeing coming from the university, but the different forms of evaluations that are done by schools, um, that are done by um, institutions, as well as data that is moved around, attached and linked to sites and places that most people don't even realize. Um, for instance, you've got your phone, you've got your Fitbit, you've dialed into these different kinds of apps. All of that data gets linked on the back end by different kinds of independent third partiers unbeknownst to you. And so Ready for Black Lives is about investigating that, making sure that we are aware of what's going on. And so we held something called COVID Conversations um, in the beginning of the pandemic. And we held that event for some key reasons. One of them was there was a call for race-based data and an interesting call from race, uh, about race-based data from people affiliated largely with the University of Toronto, um, also working in um, community organizations. But what was most um, appalling, shocking, and concerning about the request for race-based data is that there was no analysis of class uh, dispossession or a community a sense of how you say, accountability and protection. And so the face of this call for race-based data uh, the most recent face were largely from academics and or senior people linked to the University of Toronto in some way, shape or form. There were other calls for race-based data that preceded that, that were earlier calls that came before the pandemic. And those calls came out of a request and a desire to account for the injustice that Black people consistently experience when they try to access the very state resources that they pay for with their taxes. And so the question was, and has remains to be, why is it that when Black people try to access any service, whether it's the school system, that they're always policed, mistreated, and or abused? And so the call was to get the data that tells us and the public at large what these state actors who are paid by us right? In every transaction we do, taxation is collected. So we pay for that service, a service that doesn't serve us. And we wanted the clean, cold data about who was doing what, because we consistently see people being pushed aside in healthcare and left to wait in waiting rooms for hours, sometimes until it's fatal. We've seen repeatedly where police officers have misused and abused their power and moved to sequester um, evidence and or further harm victims so they cannot speak or threaten them. We've seen in school systems where board trustees and teachers have verbally assaulted, engaged in hate speech and or called police for small children who end up shackled unlike their, very much like their ancestors not that long ago. And so we consistently have not only what we think we see but what we know is documented and there's data on that. However, interestingly, we never know how many times a particular police officer, teacher, school board trustee, physician, health facility has engaged in these behaviors. Instead, the white supremacist state pulls a three card Monty and they say, let's follow the black person, the indigenous person and count how many of them come in here and call that data that answers our question. No, what they did was pull a three card Monty. We asked for the data that would allow us to see how many of these people are repeat offenders and repeat predators? And so we know we have repeat offenders and repeat predators in the school system, in the police system, as our physicians, clinicians, nurses, as health administrators in the Ministry of Health. We know that. 
We know that because for many of us, I myself and others who have been on the front lines of providing and supporting clinical care have seen repeatedly patients come back in need of emergency assistance because of the failure of clinicians to respond appropriately. And so the request that everyday Black people have and have had for decades on the books is an accounting for who are our repeat offenders? Where are they? And why are they allowed to continue to get promotions and raises? And we saw that in Ottawa. We saw an entire police force. And we know this just like we found out about the United States police force. And we've always known this, that there is a core of white supremacists that have and continue to function in every police force. And this is not new. <laughs> Go take a look. It's right there. There are people who dedicate their lives to this research. It happens not only in Canada, it happens in the US and it happens in Europe, right? That is why people who are black and not black can come out into the streets in the uprising of 2020 and before because they've seen it with their own eyes. And so the data that was asked for was the data that would allow for justice. And the data that these people asked for and said was the data that would allow for more predation. And so the very website that Alex put together, Policing the Pandemic, I remember early conversations, it is exactly that kind of data, the data that would allow for the people who are being victimized by the racialized distribution of personal protective equipment, PPE, meaning that the way in which personal, personalized protection and equipment was distributed was in the order of the racial hierarchy of white supremacy, meaning that meaning that the people who received PPE were those considered most racially bound. And we don't say this as, I don't say this as hyperbole, we say this because we've spoken to nurses, personal support workers, family members, and even clinical managers who could not believe the kinds of direction that they were receiving. And so the ways in which Black life and the lives of those who are not white, who are not serving the interests and needs of white supremacy has always been devalued. And so I wanna make a full circle. I wanna connect this strange and undesired and unrequested demand for race-based data. And I wanna tie it to the relationships of corporate influence that exist not only at our science table at the University of Toronto, which is it's largely populated by the University of Toronto, that, that those corporate relationships need to be further investigated. A colleague of mine had an article published in The Wired and it identified the number of corporations that are underwriting chairs and positions at universities in the areas of computational science, artificial intelligence, software engineering. And so what we see when we heard the conversation about um, from Sam and Adil about the relationship between the schools and the police, I wanna point out another relationship. I wanna point out a relationship not only between the schools, the police and data, but between our very own community members, the universities, because the call for race-based data was a classist one. It was one of people who forgot where they came from. And I say this for a key reason. The data that has been collected from black people through processes of harassment that have been deemed unconstitutional, and that practice is called carding. It is the same practice that evolved from slavery is in every apartheid society, including Canada. And so there have been calls for decades for that data that was illegally gotten to be purged. Instead, what we've had is a broker, a brokerage class of black bourgeoisie academics who have now gotten into the business the business that brought many of us here across the transatlantic, which is the business of brokering in black bodies, in black bodies for the service of the state and the denial of our own human rights. Because everyday black people in some neighborhoods have been carded to the level of almost 100%. Let me explain to you what that means. What that means is there are some neighborhoods where two-year-olds who are on the way to junior kindergarten or playtime with their grandmas were rolled up on by police and we're told that they must provide their information. And we've had these stories recounted where elderly folks are with their grandchildren, are harassed by police, totally shaken up. And now their data, having done nothing wrong, but walked on the streets for which they have paid for with their own grandchildren and community members are now in that database. 
And so the classism within our own community that gets weaponized against us showed up in that call for race-based data because there was a failure to reckon with or answer for the way in which that data has, is, and continues to be the illegally gotten data. And I say illegal because the decisions have already been made that it is not legal to violate Black people's constitutional rights in the interests of a select few in a white supremacist police force. That data is then connected, connected to health data. The same health data that was in police cars that they sat there in their precincts, in their cars, viewing people's medical records when no police have the authority or training to even know what they're looking at other than to stigmatize. And so I'll connect it to one last piece, which is the privatization, not just of our universities through these corporate influence relationships, but to the privatization of our health system. We actually need to have an investigation, a full commission and inquiry into the migration illegal migration of health data into police databases, and I'll tell you why. In every instance where countries have been involved in this kind of data transfer, a genocide has occurred. Either immediately thereafter, or there has been a long process to set it up. We've seen this time and time again. So the Ontario Health Data Platform is a data platform that was called into being that is connected to a number of private public partnerships, private public partnerships that in fact allow for private corporations who barely pay taxes, have significant credits given to them in order to induce them to be here, and then take data that is developed as a result of your visits with your clinician, and then take that data, and I'm going to come back to the beginning now, out of your EMR without your knowledge or consent, out of your electronic health record, and then it gets to move through unknown third parties, including Clearview. I'm now at time, so I'm just gonna say this last piece. I want us to attend to the fact that almost every single paramilitary and military tool developed in the last 10 years has been developed with biometric indicators, meaning that they are tied to your breath rate, the beat of your heart, which is a unique heart, uh, uh, rhythm, um, or your eye movement rate, as well as other identifiable and unique features that come and are largely and primarily expressed in your health record. So I think we need to be both concerned and move forward in understanding that when we talk about detasking, when we talk about defunding, that that money is being transferred from one line item to a line item which allows for high, <laughs> highly dangerous paramilitary types of equipment that allow for your biometric data at your police to be at the disposal of your police that came out of your private relationship that is protected or was protected until the court removed it to your physician. So your physician's data, the police all get mushed into one through data linkages and public private platforms that are increasingly privatized then get to share your data, which means that every detasking, every defund call must address the fact that paramilitary equipment, including the DigiDog and the RoboCop that was once on your movie screen will be coming to a neighborhood near you. Thank you, Lana, that was fire. Um, always love hearing your words and hear, hear you speak and your perspective. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to questions to all of our panelists today. Thank you so much to Sam, to Adil, to Lana. Um, just letting everyone know in the live stream, you can post questions um, in the chat um, and we will relay them to the presenters. Uh, we have one question um, to get us going uh, from someone who's in the live stream. So thank you for posting that, um, which is, even though Toronto Police, Serv or, uh, Tr Toronto Police Services has stopped using Clearview AI, is it, is it still, uh, it is still using a facial recognition technology from NEC. Is there any organizing in TO in Toronto around banning all uh, facial recognition technology by use of the Toronto Police Services? And this was initially opposed to Adil, I think, but if others have any uh, perspectives or insights, that would be great. Um, 
Thanks so much, Alex. I think that uh, there is a lot of organizing, not just regarding Clearview AI um, and or other facial recognition software, but also again, including, um, you know, these quote wellness checks um, and how that information there's been, you know, decades of um, individuals specifically like mad people who've been working on that. Um, so there is certainly some activism and, and continued work around that. Um, for sure. I think one of the things uh, just touching on um, sort of one of the things that just came up to me in terms of what Lana was saying about being mindful about what our some of our asks are and some of our uh, demands are during this time. I think a really easy example for us to draw on is uh, the current intervention by the Toronto Police Service and you know sort of non non governmental organizations that are encouraging and excited um, about the fact that uh, calls will be sent to community agencies, um, mental health calls will be sent to community agencies. So when you look at the fine print, uh, what's clear there, number one, is that the call still goes to the police. Number two is that a key piece of that intervention is if the person has a weapon, the police is still deployed. Now, if we look really quickly at what the police considers a weapon, we see everything from forks, um, you know, to, to, you know, anything else in the most recent years, particularly in Ontario around fatal shootings, right? Um, but also, I think if we look at the history in Ontario and the history in Toronto and the greater or the greater Toronto area, we've had these programs before. They were cut. St. Elizabeth's crisis team was cut, right? Like, so we've had, so I think, again, we really have to be careful when we think that, you know, a line item, like Lana says, the line item is being moved. Number one, we have to be careful that we're not creating things anew and being falsely excited about things that are not real in that way and things that have already existed, things that continue to kind of just coat, right? Um, and so just, I think, I think that alongside many other kinds of programs, I think that we're seeing, we have to be mindful about that kind of a seduction. Right. We used to have teams that went out in the city in specific communities, even that did speak these kind that spoke languages specific to that area. Right. Like we, we saw that out in West Scarborough, like we've seen these things before. So I think um, we also can't get lazy with the language about abolition and defunding because of the fact that I think we can't reach again for the closest item um, and yet and still really think about like how do we undo these kinds of expansive connections, right? Like, how do we really get in there? And how do we think about that? Um, so I, that was just one comment I wanted to add to what Lana was saying. Thank you for that, Adil. Um, and thank you for addressing that. Lana, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, in terms of the organizing, I can't speak to that specifically. Um, but what I do want to point people to that might be watching is that we're, we've been a bit slower in Canada than I think is in our best interest to mobilize on larger scale. Uh, for the people who are engaged in abolition um, in a particular kind of way, I think it's also important um, to take some cues from some of the um, uh, information that's been shared. So there's a movie called Coded Bias. Now, Coded Bias is useful for one key reason in this conversation, and that is that it shows not only Black people who constantly have to mobilize and push back against these violations that continue to happen in supposedly democratic society. And so when these technologies of facial recognition, whether by Clearview or NEC, um, all those companies have relationships with heavy armament and Department of Defense. These are companies that have massive military contracts. Um, so let's be clear, these are, not your, these are not your pedestrian tech companies. These are companies that develop weapons that make countries to disappear off maps, okay? So let's not be confused by Clearview versus NEC. The other piece I wanted to point out is that movie is it points and it shows you what we've been doing, what folks have been doing in Jane and Finch, what folks have been doing in Mad Communities, what Black folks have been doing, which is organizing the pushback. And in that film, you get a nice trajectory of how they were able to ban facial recognition software in the places where we live. And so this is, again, just another flag. 
those recognition softwares are about controlling us everywhere. So in public housing in the United States or section eight accessible housing, um, landlords had moved to use biometric entry and uh, facial recognition as the primary access point, meaning that they would be able to see every single person who entered your unit and a timed registered mark. Now remember, you did not go to prison, but this is prison cell block technology into your home. So I wanna encourage us to think about the breadth and width that data moves like the wind. So if you understand how the wind moves or how water moves and it's not easily contained, that's the data. And so to the point of the um, apps, I will strongly encourage you, please find a human being that is talk, you can talk to. Pick up the old fashioned phone, get a safe app that's double encrypted. I can give you information about that create small, discrete, encrypted circles to talk to, to talk with people when you are in distress. If you are somebody who does, you know, ad hoc community support and counseling, or if you are an NGO, it is incumbent upon you if you believe that the people in your community deserve their human rights, that you do not use, not only these apps, you do not use them, that you create and work together to use the equipment that data, data justice and digital activists who think these things through, who know about the back doors, who understand encryption and zipping and surveillance and can track the people who have no right to track you, that those communities, our communities come together. And they come together because on the back end of every single one of those calls, I have sat in numerous meetings where people who have come out of the academy in computational sciences say they wanna produce this thing. And there's no connection to the data about the violence and the deadliness when the police show up at your door. So I repeat, please find a human being. If it's the pandemic or whatever is stopping you, find and collaborate with digital justice and data justice folks who have those networks or can direct you on how to do those. Ready for Black Lives, we have a YouTube site, our web there, message us, we'll find people, we'll hook you up, but understand every single call you make, every word that you say, is recorded and we've seen in the Philippines, we've seen in other jurisdictions where that comes back, not only to haunt you, but potentially cut your life off. We, we have a, thank you for that, Lana. We have a question from the chat from Gladys Co. Um, thank you. I uh, was just wondering whether medics slash hospitals are able to see criminal records the same way the police is, has been able to uh, please see a person e, e, EMR. One never knows with these docs, they might not see us. What I can tell you is in the United States, um, that is a fact. Um, what I will say is that it would be unreasonable for us to think that with the advent of the QR codes and the increased privatization, and I just wanna point out that it, during my PhD, I had to cease doing my uh, policy legal analysis because the current administration of the Doug Ford government stripped the province of Ontario of all of our data protection laws, literally. Every time I went in, huge chunks of the legislation had disappeared and they had used the minimum 30 days that was required, but there was almost no reasonable co uh, consultation. And unless this is what you did for a living, there was no way to provide input. I did try to provide input on uh, several occasions. So I will tell you this, the technologies that have been enabled as a result of these QR codes enable this and those technologies usher us into the social credit system, which is exactly what this allows for. So I think it would be unreasonable to think um, that those capacities are not there and that they have not been used, um, especially with some of the data that we've heard from, from our science table right here in Ontario. Adele, you had your hand up. So I was just gonna add um, that uh, while I, like, I'm not, I, I can't and I won't speak specifically to what's in the, the EMR, but I do think that um, while we talk about technologies, it's also important to remember um, that, you know, when we talk to practitioners, when we talk to nurses, when we talk to doctors, when we do all of these things, that their pen is still a technology and has always been that. The narrative um, that they write about you and what you disclose or how that's understood. And so one of the things that I would always share um, to people is just to remember 
uh, what it is that you're sharing and disclosing um, and that the, this information lives, it stays on record, whether it is by using a particular algorithm or a note that a practitioner, a clinician, a, you know, educational assistant, a PSW makes, like those things are there. And so I think that that's something for us to really think about and to consider. And again, I think that um, while we move towards a discussion about uh, technologies more broadly, whether they're tools and functions, that we as human beings are, you know, one of the key sort of um, movers of any of these technologies, whether or not we're using them. Um, and so I think that that's something that we really have to keep as a part of this discussion. And so far as we are trying to create these technologies as a way to be these sort of um, objective kinds of tools and functions, and they're not because people create those tools and functions with their own biases already, right? So I think that's something that I would um, certainly encourage people to keep in mind. Thank you for that, Adele. Sam? Um, well, I don't work on, um, I guess, medical uh, data and accessibility and privacy. What I do know is that when we go into the hospital, they definitely do see race, uh, they see class, um, and that governs uh, the kind of treatment or care that we receive or that we don't. Huh? And securities in, in, in sites of medical care are intimately tied with, with police. It wasn't Jane and Finch when we had an active emergency uh, ward, and ward, an active hospital. Um, and, and I think that continues to be the case. I mean, I think what I, I just wanted to throw out there or, or you know, share with, with folks uh, is, is a report that I get um, my students to read. It's the Toronto Fallout Report. And I think it's, it's Toronto Foundation. So, you know, it's a seven, first seven months in the pandemic and a report of um, that they try to do differently, you know, talk to, you know, black community leaders, racialized folks in social services, right? Uh, tried to do interviews and did, did the report differently, yeah? And there's one anonymous account in that report and it's of a, of, a, of a black executive director. And he has a family member who's experiencing mental health crisis and he refuses to call the police. So he tries to access mental health services. This takes him a long time. It takes him a way longer time, but that to, to, to resist that urge to dial 911, right? As, as the deal's pointing out, to, pointing out to us that even in their moments of reform, this is still problematic, yeah? And police don't reform. They simply remodulate to the moment. So, so this, this black executive director, anonymous account, finally accesses services for, for his, his, his ill family member, fully aware that, you know, if he calls 911, that's playing roulette, that his family member could die. The mental health professional that he finally accesses, probably, you know, a black person or a racialized person, understanding of the terms, found, you know, found, uh, found someone who could provide the care that he needs, that his family member needed. It, that, that mental health professional tells him that because you accessed mental health services this way, you're on way lower of a priority than if you had called 911. And, and part of the presentation that I wanted to do was take out the idea or the role that police play in the kind of spectacularization of our encounters with police, right? That, that we always die. DeAndre Campbell's the worst case, called the police for care, for mental health services, needed wellness check, needed services, he died, yeah? That black executive director in that anonymous account in the Toronto Fallout Report tells us that this entire like accessing of mental health services or care uh, for black people, at least in this city and province, is literally a gamble or receive less prioritized care. Yeah. So I just want to mention also too, what were some of the pathways of resistance that we could do? That anonymous black executive director took a risk. Yeah. What we do at SBL, we don't interact with police. We don't call police. We don't take funding from police. That's also another interconnection, which we don't have time to draw on today, is that so many community organizations who want to do programming access the police as a funder. So then they come to the events, they normalize their presence. Yeah. Since I was 12, 13 years old, planning events, community events, police have always asked to be part of it. They don't ask anymore, but they've always asked to come. And they come with lots of money, lots of resources. So what are some of the pathways to resistance that we can do? I think we have to begin where we are, where a lot of our Black and racialized people are poor and working class in, in our programs and community services to push police out, not invite them to the Black History Month affair, uh, month, monthly event, not to invite them to programming, not to invite them to graduations, celebrations. Even those that trying to work with this idea of like these small acts of abolition could delegitimize police from below. Yeah. Well, I, of course, again, these conversations of 
you know, the role of policing in our society and the philosophy of policing, the legitimacy of policing, which is the discussion we're having about defunding and abolition. It's not simply a budget meeting. Um, I think it could begin there, right? And the kinds of forms of networking and lateral care that I know both Adil and Lana are intimately aware of are the kinds of things you have to do when you make the decision that you're not gonna introduce the unsafety of policing in the lives of the people that we work with. So I think, I think that's something that we've, at, at least at SBL and some of our community organizations have found useful. It also made us use our imagination, which is what abolition is about too, yeah? So thank you so much, Thomas. Just wanted to contribute that. Adele? I know we're running out of time, um, but I, I I wanted to just say like to what Sam and Lana and, and everyone has said, I, you know, I started by saying we need to go to the places where people have and continue to live through these experiences, right? Um, and so one of the things I also want us to remember, it, which is as we create these kinds of programs or in the context of the apps or in the context of like, for example, all the focus on quote mental health unquote since COVID, there's an entire, there's going to be an entire population in that that is still like really outside of that, right? And we have to, we have to think about the creation of what, what is this kind of other class of, of disabled person, other class of mental health, right? Person, because the folks that I know uh, for many reasons don't even have a phone or an internet, right? Um, for a whole host of very real reasons. And so when we think about that, I think as we sort of move through the pandemic or move through, you know, trying to get back to life, we have to think about this entire subsect of communities who are entering into conversations um, and who is who will be left out and continues to be left out because none of this money is going directly into the hands of the individuals who need it. And you know, there's 45 million and large numbers of millions, right? Um, I'm not seeing peer run, I'm not seeing community led, I'm not seeing those things and those funds, right? So we really have to think about that to Sam's point around where is the money going to who, why, and with what authority there. Right. So always follow the money is just, I think, the last thing that I would also say, because that tells its own story and narrative. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. And uh, Lana? Um, I wanted to say, like, everything that's been said has been really important. Um, and I wanted to make a, some additional linkages um, to, to also what Adil said and uh, Sam said. So in terms of the infrastructure, what we saw um, was this current move to, quote, allocate some of the calls through this switchboard process. Um, again, another three card Monty where <laughs> you're supposed to, you're supposedly getting access to community services, but it's going through um, a paramilitary dialer that then does fixation points and data points on you, and again, without your consent or knowledge. And so what we watched in that whole process, and I, I encourage people to go back and look at the depositions that were done by the city and the articles and the outcry, the movement to move the mental health services away from policing was done by grassroots organizations who had been providing those supports um, informally and formally to their own members for a very long time, as Adil said, and knew and know how to get in touch with and how to hold and care for each other. What happened again was another takeover by the bourgeoisie NGO cartel. What we saw were NGOs who had taken the voices of community members through the various speakers bureaus, gotten themselves this particular kind of recognition after also having, having abused those very same clients to then put themselves forward to a ginormous multi-million dollar deal, which then pushed grassroots folks who know how to do that work, who know how to engage with people who do not have access nor want or need access to particular kinds of technologies that tether them. So there's a, a theme here. Where you see the entry of technology, you see the mobilization of class, you see the mobilization of people within our own quote racial classes, um, weaponizing their education and their new wealth, or some of them are old money too, and then also weaponizing the university and its data collection powers with paramilitary and de defense departments. And I wanna refer people back to a scholar strike I had the privilege of doing with Dr. Walcott, where he gave us a wonderful 25 year history of the paramilitary movements through the university that then trickled down to J through K. And so 
we have to pay attention to how class and gender are constantly weaponized against and within our own. And so when we don't see the police, we see the members of our own communities take on the work of the police so that we cannot nor feel comfortable resisting. And that that infrastructure of grassroots that's being destabilized means that we are now drawing on more violent means of management. So whenever we see technology, these apps, it means that there is a river being poisoned, indigenous people around the world being pushed off their land and massive amounts of environmental pollutants that are generated. So there's no separation between environmental racism the rates of cancer that then get you in the EMR, <laughs> that then make your body more at risk of not being able to fight off immune um, attacks from what have always been settler pandemics that have changed the world. There's a great book in epidemiology about that. And then push you into databases that criminalize you. What does it mean to have never committed a crime as many Black people know, as many disabled and mad people know, and to be in a database that is tied to massive third party paramilitary and private organizations that track you all over the world. And I wanna remind people that whenever they ask and wanna talk about race-based data, communities, communities need to understand the word black, the word mental health, the word queer does not translate in computational language. What we enter are a set of symbols and numbers that are then attached to other symbols and numbers and they weight that down. So you don't even have to be black in a database to be black because we can run an algorithm around all the things associated with the negativity of blackness and you are therefore pulled out. And if you spend too much time with us, which is why many communities um, are taught to disavow black and indigenous people, you too can be weighted in that system. So these calls for race-based data taught us one thing, that when the state has data, and it doesn't like what it says, it does the same thing it did with the testing data. They throw it away, they stop collecting it, and they shutter it from the people who could help us understand what it means and how to respond. We know they had the data, as Sam said, they saw the long lineups, but people who were interested in that kind of intervention of care in vaccines still couldn't get it. So whenever there's calls for race-based data, be very careful, because there's not a country in the world who has collected the racial data of those who have been subjected to apartheid and not crush them, imprison them, murder them, either in massive groups or as we experience right now. So there is no safety in race-based data because those of us who know those who have passed away would have more than gladly stepped up and answered that question in a consent-based process, which is why the international community forbids unconsensually collected information because it violates the fundamental premise that you are a free and independent person. So I just want us to remember that, as she said, the pen is the technology. When anybody asks you to document your race on a document, I want you to think about the relationship of the state to the quote, your race. And the data is damning. The graves are many and the morgues don't cease to be full. If you want your data, have your trusted community members and your data justice advocates who are accountable to somebody who lives somewhere where we know your mama is and we know what your address is, not these people in uniforms, not these people in universities who get degrees and forget where they came from, who they are and what they're supposed to be doing to be a treaty person living in peace and not creating drama and hardship and death. So I just wanna end with that. I wanna say thank you very much to the Scholar Strike to helping us keep it real. Thank you so much, Lana, for your words. And also, if people haven't seen uh, the Ready for Black Lives COVID conversation series, it's really leading and legendary in terms of the conversations you've uh, been pushing for uh, in this context. And so thank you for all of your work. And thank you uh, to Adil and to Sam for all of your work. Um, much love and respect to all of you for taking time today to be with us. Um, and to share your work and your perspectives uh, for everyone at the Scholars Strike. Um, thank you to Beverly Bain and to Gary Kinsman, and especially to our ASL interpreters. Thank you so much um, for all of your great work. Thank you. Um, and I uh, wish everyone all the best as they go to all the rest of the Scholar Strikes events. Um, and much respect, love, and solidarity to all of you. Take care. Thank you. Sorry for talking fast. <laughs>
You were great. Thank you.